Greetings, uh, colleagues, um, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day. Um, it's very exciting um, for us to open this uh, plenary um, on uh, social determinants of health during and, and also uh, post uh, pandemics. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be hosting uh, this uh, panel and, and plenary. My name is uh, Mosa Mushabela. I am a professor of uh, public health um, and the deputy vice chancellor for research and innovation at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in, in South Africa. Uh, I am based in Durban and I'm also connecting um, from, from Durban at, at this point. And uh, it's a pleasure for me also to join the CEGH uh, 2022 and the, as with the theme of healthy people, a healthy planet and social justice. The, the panel, uh, this plenary is going to be focusing on uh, social determinants of health and we've got a, an exciting panel of speakers who are experts in social determinants of health. And um, I'm just gonna give you a quick list of the, the speakers and then I'm going to introduce the first one. And I'm sure all of you will have a lot of thoughts, questions, comments, please use the Q&A uh, uh, section and the chat section to raise these issues. When the time comes uh, for us to pick up on the points that you're raising, we'll bring it to the panel. Uh, we are going to first hear from Professor Francis Omaswa, um, who is Executive Director of Africa Center for Global Health and Social Transformation in Uganda. He will also be con connecting with us from Kambala in Uganda. And next we'll hear from um, Jock uh, Pastotti, daughter, who is a co-founder and CEO of uh, Training for Health Equity Network, NET. And then after that, we'll hear from Dr. Vincent uh, Chupaka, who is a Director of Research and Training at Partners in Health, based in, in Rwanda. And uh, last but not least, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Kumanan Rasanathan, who is Unit Head of, uh, for Equity and Health at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. So that's the panel, it's very exciting. Lots of um, um, uh, experience and uh, expertise on this issue. And I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, colleagues are going to share with us. So I will first invite Professor Francis Omaso to open the plenary for us. Um, he's going to give us an oral presentation uh, Professor Francis Omasa is the founder and executive director of ACHES, the Africa Center for Global Health and Social Transformation. Um, many of us know him and know him uh, well, and he needs no introduction in this regard. But uh, for those who doesn't know him, he's, got, um, he's a leader in Africa, um, and he's got a lot of experience over the years. And uh, for recently, he's also been assisting with the COVID-19 response in, uh, in Uganda. Uh, as chair of the National Committee Engagement, um, uh, Community Engagement Committee. And uh, he's also chair of the African Health Systems Governance uh, Network, um, and also chancellor of the Soroti University in Uganda. So he brings with him a lot of experience. He's got man many other roles that he has occupied um, over the years, and I'm sure he'll be drawing from all of that to share his, his views with us. Uh, Prof. Omaso, if you can just drop your screen a little bit so that we can see your full face. I can see you, but I want to kind of be able to see. Uh, there you go. That's better. Thank you very much. Over to you, sir. Welcome. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to meet up with uh, so many old friends in this meeting, and it's great that AfriHealth is playing a role in CUGH as uh, we envisaged uh, when we established it. And uh, great that uh, we as Africans have been given this session uh, to, to uh, well, we are not all, we are all Africans. It's uh, uh, one way or another, we started from here so many centuries ago. So I'm going to talk about our experience in Uganda on managing uh, COVID through community engagement. And uh, the story starts uh, with uh, the National COVID Task Force 
for who chaired by His Excellency the President of Uganda. And the vision is that COVID response should leave Uganda's health system much stronger and better prepared to address social determinants of health, achieve SDGs, achieve uh, our aspirations for health for all, and also uh, strengthen uh, universal coverage long after the epidemic has gone. The goal is to see that all people in the country are aware, they are empowered, and are participating actively in the prevention and control of the outbreak of COVID-19, both as a duty and a right, and using as much as possible existing structures and systems and resources. And the key guiding principle is that if we empower individuals and communities, it is individuals and communities where good health starts from. And good health is created by individuals and their families and the communities. And when it breaks down, then we call upon the skills and knowledge and technology of health professionals. But first and foremost, most of us are born healthy physiologically. If we just obey our bodies and do the right things, we don't need health professionals for a long time. And getting this message to the communities is very important in the journey towards community engagement. We know that it's possible for people to influence their health conditions where they live and work, provided that they are given the opportunity to do so and the necessary support by the health system. And that the communities and individuals should not be perceived as passive resistance recipients of health services. So in September 2020, the president of Uganda uh, through the National COVID Task Force established the community engagement subcommittee, which I was asked to chair. And we developed a community engagement strategy uh, responding then to stage four of the pandemic. And we established multi-sector village COVID task forces in every single village in Uganda. And this task force or task forces were led by an elected administrator who already existed in the administrative structure of the country. And it also included community health workers. It included other sectors, it included cultural leaders. It included religious leaders, these task forces. They met regularly for community dialogue, sharing information, not just about COVID, but also other health conditions, not only about COVID and other health conditions, but also other things which were of interest to them as a community, such as water sources, security, law and order, gender-based violence, teenage, teenage pregnancies, among others. So community health workers in these task forces made maps of the villages, visited households regularly, referred suspected cases of COVID, to the health facilities for testing, also referred patients and clients like pregnant women and so on to health facilities and provided home-based care where necessary for COVID. And this was a very big, big, big uh, um, way in which we were able to get on top of our COVID. Um, so uh, these village COVID task forces are now here in the country and they are active to varying degrees of efficiency, but we look forward to them now remaining as a normal part of the integrated primary health care community health system here, which is led by the people themselves and which uh, um, uh, it will ensure that COVID infections when they occur are minimized as much as possible and prompt diagnosis is done and where necessary treatment takes place within the community. So COVID response will therefore remain the foundation, leave behind a foundation of a strong primary health care system 
as our first line of defense against other infections as well, other infectious diseases as well. And we believe that this approach will accelerate the achievement of SDGs and universal health coverage in Uganda, uh, particularly through an enhanced uh, ownership uh, of health agenda by the people themselves. So the outcomes which we have observed so far are that communities, we were able to mobilize the communities, they became aware, they trusted the health system better, and they took ownership locally where they lived to ensure that uh, COVID uh, uh, is uh, uh, under control and that other health conditions were addressed. Uh, and uh, SOPs and so on. And do we believe that uh, uh, an outcome which I've just reported is that the Ugandan health system has been strengthened and will be better prepared uh, for uh, universal health coverage. And we have used intersectoral collaboration and the whole of society approach, which enables all concerned in society uh, to be aware of their health responsibilities. And the key lessons learned, number one, is that organized communities are capable of owning and taking responsibility for their health, including achieving social cohesion through regular community dialogue sessions. The second lesson is that communities are capable of identifying problems and finding solutions in their in their communities. It is impressive to listen to them do this. They are very smart. And then once they own the problems, they also will give you the solutions. Further, that organized communities do improve relations with the health facilities and improve the performance of the entire health system. So as I conclude, I would like to uh, uh, observe that social determinants in African health systems can be addressed through integrated people-centered primary health care led by the people themselves, both as a duty and a right. But while this has been demonstrated to work well in so many countries, I am disappointed that not enough has been done to implement this approach to scale despite the evidence that we have. And I pray and hope that COVID could be an opportunity for us to make a new effort in this very effective approach to primary health care and to addressing social determinants of health in our communities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Omasa. And I'm also really happy that the gods of internet uh, were kind to us and your connection was clear. We had your presentation, really incredible. And I already have a, a list of questions for you and looking forward to engaging further on this as we proceed with the, with the panel. Once again, thank you so much for making yourself available. Um, next, I would like to invite Jock Pals' daughter, who is a CEO, Chief Executive Officer, and co-founder of uh, Training for Health Equity Network, the NET. And I think most of us would have by now heard of this global partnership of health, health workforce education institutions, and they are committed to reducing health inequities and increasing uh, social uh, accountability. And uh, I, Jock has also been involved in a number of uh, other um, activities, including uh, data and the evidence hub at the World Health Organization and Innovation uh, Collaborative as chair, um, which is at the National Academies of Science in the US and, and a number of other events. Uh, she was also involved in setting up the Center for Global Health at uh, New York University. Jock, you're most welcome and we're looking forward to, to, to your talk on how to prepare healthcare health professionals to mitigate the effects of social determinants uh, of health. Thank you so much, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to, to be uh, on this panel today for this uh, important discussion. Let me just see, are you all seeing my screen? 
we can see your full screen, Jock. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay, great. So, as Professor Amaswa said, it, it, this uh, the response to the COVID pandemic, I think, highlighted the importance of, of the social determinants of health and the fact that uh, we need all hands on deck to address the challenges related to it. And the disproportionate burden of, of COVID-19 illness and death borne by people in marginalized communities, whether that was in, in the United States or high income countries or low income countries, had often little to do with the virus itself and more to do with the social determinants of health. But it also illustrated how a better understanding, uh, data driven as well, and more equitable health and social system and a better prepared and supported health workforce could be transformative in improving health in general and perhaps particularly improve the preparedness and response to pandemics. And uh, interestingly enough, I, th I think our work also found that community engagement is, is a key to that. So let me just see if I can move here. Uh, oops. Mm -hmm. Trying to move that for some reason. I guess I'm on the wrong mouse. Maybe it's this work. No. Okay, I'm trying to get the. Okay, so just quickly here, so just the training for health equity network, as I said, is involves uh, schools that are are striving towards social accountability uh, around the world. But let me just get to the project that I want to talk to you about. Uh, it is uh, a USAID funded project called the Local Health System Sustainable Sustainability Project, and it's led by APT Associates and it works with partners around the world to reduce financial barriers to care uh, and treatment, ensure equitable access to essential health services and improve the quality of health services. So in, in uh, 2021 and early 2022 this year, we worked on a project that sought to identify, analyze, and document successful efforts to integrate the social terms of health into health workforce education, training, quality assurance, and service delivery, with a particular focus on low and middle income countries. And, and it included a literature review, surveys in, in 12 uh, low and middle income countries, drafting of a sort of a general theory of change, key informant interviews and case studies. And uh, let me see, I don't know why I can't seem to go to the next slide. Oops, no, nope. okay, now I think I've figured it out, sorry. So what we found, and this I'll just go over very briefly over the key findings, is that there's actually significant knowledge gap in knowledge on uh, uh, how we integrate social terms of health into health workforce education and training, accreditation and quality assurance, as well as service delivery. Doesn't mean it's not happening, uh, but particularly in the literature review, we did not find much in terms of uh, coming from, from uh, low and middle income country. And, but we, however, know that uh, some of the greatest efforts actually are taking place there. Um, but we certainly found that in, in limited cases, our competencies related to, to social terms of health uh, incorporated into accreditation and quality assurance standards. So this is sort of general or they done or mentioned in a very sort of broad way. Now, one thing that was really interesting, particularly in the literature review, that there was a lack of shared understanding of uh, what the social determinants of health are and how, what might be effective approaches. Uh, and there's not always a consensus on terminology. Uh, what is considered social determinants of health and whether that's mostly a sort of function of public health and what's the role of, of clinicians, for example, and other sectors in addressing the negative effects of um, the social determinants of health. Another thing which was also clear that there was no global or general agreement on key competencies related to social determinants of health for, for the health workforce in general. 
Um, we did find that there were interventions at, at different levels, at systems and community levels, organization and patient and provider levels that focused on identifying barriers and efforts to mitigate the negative effects on quality of care and on health equity. And as Professor uh, Omasa was saying, community engagement was very much a key theme at, at that level. So at, at uh, systems and community levels, the interventions usually included community engagement. Like I, I think the perfect example would be uh, the uh, effort that Professor Omasawa was just mentioning in Uganda. But intersectoral action is, is a where we're intervention that we also found data collection and sharing to support evidence-based decision-making. At organizational levels, what we found in service delivery is that it tended to be uh, a changing context-specific design and particular alignment with population needs. Um, so clinics might, might do community outreach. Uh, there might be support with transportation. These are just examples of changing operating hours, et cetera. So the organizations or facilities were sometimes making efforts uh, to mitigate those negative effects. And also using clinical experience and research to bring attention to the actual health impact of socioeconomic challenges um, and advocate for policy changes. At the level of patients and providers, our work um, described how there's an increased use of social determinants of health screening tools that are particularly being used or at least documented in, in high income countries and often with, with the health workers that are focusing on immigrant and refugee health, indigenous communities, or other sort of community oriented primary care. Now, uh, we found some evidence where screening tools uh, and referring patients then to relevant services, improved social conditions for patients and their families, while outcomes for health workers included lighter workloads. However, there are certainly ethical concerns around using uh, such screening tools if service availability, accessibility, and acceptability is in question, or if clinicians and staff do not have the resources or competencies to address difficult challenges such as, for example, domestic violence issues that come up. And while, again, community engagement appeared, appeared as a uh, learning intervention or pedagogical tool, it also emerged as an institutional and systemic strategy um, at education institutions. And that means that the education institution established long-term partnership with various community-based groups, com community partners were often providing input into the design, implementation, and evaluation of educational interventions and programs. And what often seemed to happen in, in those cases were that social terms of health related uh, elements were reflected throughout the education program. So it was not just the course, but actually built in both in how the education institutions operated, for example, where community members are part of decision-making, and who they selected into their program and how institutions evaluated their outcomes. And interestingly, we also found that in our case study in Nepal, which is, is uh, really has integrated uh, social determinants of health at all levels, uh, both in theoretical, but, but also in clinical training, both in, in, which includes significant time spent in highly marginalized communities and very rural and remote communities in Nepal. And uh, a study done uh, around with graduates uh, during the COVID, COVID pandemic, actually, what was interesting, what they found that those graduates who had spent this time already knowing how to work with communities and engage with communities were often drawn into leadership positions to plan the efforts and make them sort of the leaders, particularly in community engagement, as they were often uh, more effective at communicating and mobilizing and listening to, to people, particularly the most marginally, often literate people, and help them change their behavior because trust had been built and they knew the context in which they were working in. 
So again, this is just a highlight of, of some of the findings that we had. Uh, and we, it's clear we still have a lot to learn about how to mitigate the negative effects of the social determinants of health. We know it requires structural and policy changes and a focus on collaborative action. Um, so while understanding the role of social determinants of health is essential for all health workers, uh, they need to understand how that affects health. However, unless you provide them with competencies uh, to at least mitigate the effects, this knowledge can actually be disempowering. And we need to provide them with the tools and competencies to address and mitigate those effects. They're all interlinked factors. And again, as Professor Romasco was talking about, communities and patients need to be partners in this effort if we are to reduce health inequities and improve health and well-being in our most vulnerable communities. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, uh, Jock. If you can take the slides down. Um, yes, let me just. Too. We'll, uh, that was very interesting. And I think that uh, it um, dovetailed very nicely with the opening remarks from uh, Professor Omasa, indeed. And uh, in a way, I think that it does raise some issues that we kind of need to relate based on the work you've done and, and the work that uh, was done in, in, in Uganda as well. Um, I would like to now uh, call upon our next uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Vincent uh, Chubaka from um, Rwanda. He's a doctor, a health researcher, and an educator, and uh, he's been for many years a rural clinician, then a lecturer, then a researcher, and then a head of department for primary health care at the University of Rwanda. And um, he is uh, a trained uh, specialist in family and community medicine and holds a PhD in, in medicine. He's going to uh, speak to us about the socioeconomic and psychosocial needs of chronic care patients during COVID-19 based on the work that they have also done. There's a survey that will be sharing with us. Thank you so much. Over to you, uh, Dr. Chubaka. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone. Yes, uh, as Moza said, I'll be sharing uh, uh, some of our experience in supporting uh, our patient, particularly patient with chronic uh, uh, diseases uh, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic when it was just starting. And this is in Rwanda, and uh, I'm presenting all this from the perspective of uh, the, the partners in health. Um, that uh, uh, is based in Rwanda and uh, support or accompany the, 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 the government in, uh, in um, strengthening the health system in uh, free, uh, free districts, free rural, rural districts. Then when COVID-19 uh, has uh, started it, in Rwanda, of course, as uh, elsewhere, it disrupted uh, people's lives directly or indirectly. At PH Rwanda, we were uh, and are still uh, particularly concerned by the indirect effects and consequences of COVID-19, particularly among uh, our patients who live with chronic diseases. Therefore, as we responded uh, to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, at PIH, we also made the choice to continue supporting the most uh, vulnerable now more than ever, because that is the, 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 the job we, we, we do at Partners in Health. Then to, to better support patients, we conducted a survey uh, to assess disruption caused by COVID-19 on access to care, as well as uh, uh, the already fragile socioeconomic and psychological well-being of our patients with chronic diseases in uh, the three districts that PIH support uh, in Rwanda, uh, which are uh, Burera, Kirehe, and Kayonza. Then the objectives of uh, uh, the, 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 this survey was first to estimate the proportion of patients who cannot uh, access care due to the changes brought on uh, uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic and who needed support, uh, including transportation or advocacy, 
uh, to access the care they needed. Then we, the second objective was to assess the impact of COVID-19 uh, on household income sources and estimate the proportion of patients who need socioeconomic support to meet their basic needs in terms of food, health insurance, housing, education for ch children, because this is, this is what we, we do. And we knew that uh, during a COVID-19 pandemic, the needs, those needs will uh, increase. Then the third uh, objective was to assess the effect of changes due to COVID-19 pandemic on psycho social well-being of patients and by estimating the proportion of those who needed uh, support to improve psychosocial well-being and clinical uh, outcomes. This was measured by the proportion of patients who reported moderate to severe uh, symptoms uh, of depression. Then what we did, uh, as I mentioned, we conducted the survey in the free uh, uh, district that uh, are, sub are supported by DH. We included a patient enrolled in uh, the um, uh, chronic care uh, uh, programs, including HIV, NCD mental health, oncology, and uh, the pediatric development clinic. And uh, we only um, included a patient who had appointment between March and June 2020, because we knew that those who, as the, 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 the pandemic was starting, those would be the, the most challenged in uh, accessing the care they needed. We, we, we uh, used a stratified random sampling approach, and uh, we calculated a sample size of 240 participants, including both patients and caregivers. Then uh, data collection and analysis as well uh, were done uh, 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 sometime between April and May. And the data collection uh, uh, we used here phone interviews because that was the only option we had during the lockdown period. And uh, we uh, used uh, questions that were uh, 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 taken from different validated tools. Then, um, to give context to uh, uh, the data and the perspective to the key findings that I'll be showing, uh, here are a few uh, 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 participant characteristics. Uh, we ended up interviewing uh, 220 respondents, including 68 patients, uh, so 62 uh, female uh, patients, and 22% uh, percent of uh, participants didn't have uh, uh, any education, uh, um, and uh, 93 uh, of them had uh, uh, sus subscribed to the National Health Assurance that is called uh, Mutual in Rwanda. In terms of clinical programs, uh, we had uh, uh, the, the NCD, HIV, mental health, and PDC somehow balanced in terms of uh, uh, participation around 20 to 23. Then oncology, we only had 14% of participants who came from uh, uh, the oncology program. Then uh, quickly, uh, I'll go through the key findings. Uh, um, about the effect of COVID-19 on patient access to healthcare, uh, uh, and I, I, I don't have time to go through uh, what uh, the findings per program. I'll only focus on the, the total here. You can see that 39% uh, of patients reported a reduced ability of taking medication at home as prescribed uh, for reasons that uh, included feeling sad or depressed, running out of medication, avoiding to take uh, uh, medication in the sight of uh, household members, and or forgetting to take their prescribed medication. And 23% of patients reported the lack of access to uh, emergency care, uh, while 16% of patients skipped clinical appointments due to COVID-19. And 16% of patients also reported to stop uh, treatment due to COVID-19. And uh, only 6% of patients reported the lack of access to medication uh, due to COVID-19. And again, this is was in the, in the beginning of the pandemic here in Rwanda, uh, where we immediately started with a lockdown. Then uh, about the socioeconomic effect of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, um, we, we found that looking at this part of the graph, 
35% uh, of patients or care, their caregivers reported the loss of income due to COVID-19, while 30% uh, of patients reported or their caregivers, of course, uh, reported to, to stop their usual work due to COVID-19. And 36% uh, uh, percent of patients or caregivers reported a lack of food due to COVID-19. And there were, uh, when you look at, we compare, we compare the different districts here, here in Rwanda, in Rwanda, the three districts that were included in the study, there were similar socioeconomic effect of COVID-19 in all those three districts. Then uh, for uh, psychosocial status of patient during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that was measured by the proportion of uh, patient who reported moderate to severe symptoms of depression. We found that 23% of patients reported uh, moderate to severe uh, symptom of depression. Uh, I wouldn't go into details uh, per program. We also looked at uh, 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 knowledge and, and access to, 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 to preventive measures uh, from patients. And all patients and caregivers reported good knowledge of COVID-19 as well as uh, 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 strategies for uh, it, uh, infection prevention. 44% of patients or their caregivers reported not to have regular access to soap, while 99.1% of, of patients could not afford hand sanitizer. Uh, uh, and again, this was at the beginning of uh, the pandemic where some of the, uh, the, the actually big portion of the population didn't even know uh, what is hand, hand sanitizer, especially those living in, the, in, the, in, the, in the rural areas. And those are the patients that we are targeting here. Then 12% uh, percent of uh, uh, the, 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 the patients who participated in this study didn't have re regular access to, 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 to water. Then uh, in conclusion, um, looking at the key findings and uh, trying to draw some recommendations. First, COVID-19 has negatively affected access to healthcare, uh, food security, the economy as well as the psychology of chronic care patients. Then um, we recommended that uh, because socioeconomic security is a key determinant of health and we can't provide good health care without considering it, we uh, uh, recommended to regularly check the socioeconomic status of patients and communities in general uh, so, so as we can plan, monitor and evaluate socioeconomic and clinical support uh, uh, that is needed here. Then uh, COVID-19 has affected the ability to take medication at home as prescribed, particularly for uh, in uh, the survey for MCD and mental health patients. To improve their adherence, we uh, uh, recommended to advocate for the inclusion of uh, community health workers, home visits to both MCD and mental health uh, patients. Uh, so to include that in the community health uh, national strategy, particularly during COVID-19 and, uh, and the other pandemics to come. Um, finally, access to healthcare was uh, uh, particularly affected by COVID-19 in some of uh, the districts. Uh, all districts were, were not uh, affected the same way then uh, that way we recommended to come up with uh, innovative way to increase access to healthcare uh, and also to mobilize and reallocate uh, resources to hard increasing access to healthcare. Here in uh, Partners in Health, we've particularly invest in uh, um, uh, partnership with uh, uh, um, uh, a company that deliver medical, uh, medical products uh, using drones this is Zipline. We've been collaborating so as they deliver uh, um, cancer drugs to our patients near their homes in uh, the, the nearest health centers. Just uh, one example, we've been partnering, partnering with uh, hospitals, especially in, rural, in uh, uh, urban areas, to make sure that our patients coming from uh, 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 those uh, areas could still have uh, access to, to care. We organize transport for, for, for uh, those uh, patients, uh, those who had appointment, those who, who had to get their, their um, oncology drugs, especially those who are taking IV drugs. 
so as they could access the care they needed uh, during uh, the, the pandemic. I can't uh, close uh, uh, this pre presentation uh, without uh, um, remembering Paul Farmer. Dr. Paul Farmer, uh, co-founder of, uh, co of Partners in Health, whom we suddenly lost uh, uh, in February. Uh, Partners in Health Works is driven by his vision of healthcare as a human right and uh, his pursuit of social justice and, uh, and equity in health. The work that I've, been, uh, I've just presented to you is anchored in this vision and where a patient must be seen and supported beyond the only uh, biomedical, physical needs that they have. And in PIH, we will continue to work for a world where everyone without discrimination has access to quality care. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chewbacca. That was um, a perfect closing remark in terms of um, a tribute to the late uh, Paul Farmer, and uh, especially immediately after highlighting the inequities that we see um, when we see patients in, in our hospitals and clinics. And yet, there is such a disconnect between um, what we consider healthcare services or the health system and the realities that patients face in the community and, and in their homes. And, you know, with COVID-19, we, we, we now have, as you say, healthcare workers having to reckon with those realities that patients face in their homes and communities, failing which it makes it very difficult to actually respond to their health needs. And also those realities makes their vulnerabilities even more acute to, to, to COVID-19 and its complications. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, let me invite now our final uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Kumanan Rasanathan, who is um, the unit head of equity and health at the World Health Organization. He, he was also before that in Cambodia, working with the WHO on health systems and also assisted with COVID-19 response there. And uh, he was previously also at UNICEF in New York, um, again, working on issues of implementation research, um, health systems and so forth. And uh, he has also previously worked at the WHO specifically focusing on primary health care, health systems, as well as uh, social determinants of health. Dr. Kumar, you're welcome. And uh, please uh, take us through your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Moshabella. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to speak today after I've already learned so much. It's a real pleasure to be part of this panel on social determinants. And so I'm going to speak on the COVID-19 crisis as a lens on social determinants of health equity and, and consider what are the necessary actions going forward. And in fact, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be going last because uh, the comments of the colleagues so far have really outlined what's needed on social determinants of health and health equity and how we need to go much further forward if we are going to realize people like uh, Paul Farmer's vision. And I think really the overall, the narrative I'd like to suggest as we go into the discussion is that we are in a time of crisis. We are thinking about recovery and that we really need to focus on the social determinants of health and health equity if we want to fulfill our ambition of achieving the SDGs by 2030 and ensuring that everybody has health and well-being for all at all ages. So. Uh, the CUGH conference theme of healthy planet, healthy people and social justice is, is so important and, and so fundamental at this uh, very difficult time and it's been a di very difficult few years. The Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which WHO supported, reported in 2008 and its headline claim was that social injustice is killing people on a grand scale. And sadly, if we reflect here in 2022, 14 years later, social injustice is still killing people on a grand scale. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has underlined 
how our failure to, as, as previous speakers have said, to sufficiently adopt a social determinants approach. And what do we mean by that? Well, primarily prioritizing uh, multi-sectoral or whole of society action for health. Health is not just about healthcare, it's very important, but health is about so much more. And then secondly, our failure to really place equity and a focus on marginalized populations at the center of societal efforts, not just for health. Well, what has a failure to adopt a social determinants approach done? It's, it's in this crisis, it's led to millions of unnecessary deaths, billions of disrupted lives, and trillions of dollars of economic damage. So what do we mean by that? So at the end of last year, WHO, we, our team, we produced uh, an evidence brief drawing on rapid systematic reviews, looking at COVID-19, social determinants of health and health equity. And what did we see? Firstly, as others have alluded to, we have seen profound inequities in COVID-19, infection, hospitalization, morbidity, and mortality, both between and within countries. And so marginalized racial and ethnic minorities, including indigenous peoples, low paid essential workers, and we've really questioned now what is an essential worker? Who do we value in society? Migrants, populations picked by emergencies such as conflicts, um, older populations in, in, in residential care, incarcerated populations, homeless people. These groups have seen higher rates of COVID-19 infection, morbidity and mortality. But these inequities have been linked to inequalities in the social determinants of health, to, to poverty and deprivation, to poor quality housing, to the imposed mobility of low paid workers in precarious employment, poor weight, work safety, lack of social protection, inequitable access to health communication, around information, uh, around healthcare, and of course the epidemics, the infodemic of misinformation. And really it has been that these inequalities in the social determinants of health have mean that firstly people perhaps have had higher rates of chronic disease, so higher susceptibility to COVID. People have had uh, inequitable access to healthcare, but more importantly, they've had uh, these inequalities in social determinants have often mean that they've had this inequitable ability to adhere to public health and social measures. It's very difficult, for example, to stay at home uh, to protect yourself if you have to go out every day to get cash to put food on the table. So the populations that have been able to work at home, who, who have secure jobs, who have had sick leave, really represent groups who are higher on the social gradient. And so as we know in social determinants, it is these inequalities in people's living conditions that lead to these profound inequities in health outcomes. We've also seen, and we've seen there from the presentation from Dr. Chewbacca, inequalities in health service disruption. And then again, again, as alluded to by Dr. Chewbacca, we've seen these inequalities in the social economic impacts themselves, not just of COVID, but also of the measures to, to counter COVID. So we've been seeing millions of people driven into poverty with social protection systems struggling. Job losses have been disproportionate. There's, that has increased gender equality with women more likely to lose jobs. Disruptions for our youth, profound intergenerational inequity uh, with disrupted education for millions. And, inequalities in the way education has been disrupted, undermining of food security, and increased discrimination, stigmatization with impacts on mental health. So the picture is, 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 not, is not a happy one, but what does this show? It shows that the ethical imperative to reduce health inequities that the Commission on Social Determinants of Health foregrounded remains no less urgent than it was in 2008 when the commission issued its call to close the gap in a generation. And since then, one, one should not lose the fact that dramatic improvements of health have occurred in some areas. And total global under five child deaths have reduced from 7.45 million in 2008 to 5.2 million in 2019. Average global life expectancy in that period has increased by over three years from around 69 in 2008 to about 
almost 73 in 2019. Countries like Rwanda have seen almost five years of improvement in, in life expectancy. But that was before COVID, and we know that the pandemic has caused stagnation in these improvements and even reversals in, in, in many indicators. For example, recently we've, we've found, very sadly, that, that malaria for the first time, we're seeing increases in, in mortality after a long period of, of trajectory of improvement. So much remains to be done. And, and we know that whilst there's been progress, those profound inequities for example, the, the gap between the best performing country and worst performing country in life expectancy in 2019 was still 33 and a half years. We know that in many countries, health inequities within, within those countries over the last decade have increased. So the commission said that the problem was a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs, unfair economic arrangements and bad politics. And I would say, suggest perhaps that this is what we've seen that these continue to drive health inequities for all the very impressive initiatives that we've heard from today from Uganda, from Nepal, from Rwanda. Many countries have made progress. There's been many examples of bravery in, in Africa. We've seen very good efforts, early efforts to respond to COVID and in many ways seen lower impacts. So it's not that everything is bad, but there is so much more to do. And so the commission's recommendations in 2008 to improve daily living conditions, to tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources, and enhance monitoring of social determinants and health equity. They very much still illuminate what is required, but then we need to consider well, what have been the barriers to implementation of those recommendations, which means that we haven't seen the progress on health equity, on social justice for health that we would like. And before I get to then summarizing briefly what, I, what, need, what might need to be done, and I think that's already been well illuminated so far in the discussion, we also just need to reflect that today, in this moment, we don't just face the COVID crisis, we face the climate crisis, which is the most existential crisis to our survival. We face crises of numerous wars. Of course, uh, the war in Ukraine is, 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 is demands our attention, but there are wars in many countries still, unfortunately, some of those which do not demand so much global attention, sadly. And we know that the people who have the worst health with the most profound inequities, the least progress, are those communities affected by the, the, the tragedy of conflict, of war, which is, of course, completely avoidable. And so when we see these interlinked crises, uh, COVID with its long-lasting social and economic impacts, the climate crisis, which is moving past the point of no return for, for a healthy planet. And, and a crisis of multilateralism with increasing instability and conflict, increasing polarization within societies, between countries, which is confounding our attempts to create peace and security. It really makes us pause and reflect about what we need. And surely what these crises demand is transformational change if we want to achieve the, social, the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, and they require health equity. Health equity is not just about health. Health equity is an indicator, it's a symptom of the health of our societies. And the COVID-19, the climate, the crisis of conflict show that health equity is not just an ethical imperative, but instead that addressing the social determinants of health equity is essential through, is essential infrastructure for flourishing societies, to build the resilience and the social cohesion so that we can navigate and minimize the impact of crises of whatever cause, which will continue to occur. So I think we've heard already some of the directions that we need to focus on. These are we've known for a long time. We've been talking about these since primary health care in 1978 and before. Uh, uh, our Director General at WHO, Dr. Tedros, uh, when he articulated his vision and his priorities for his next term, the first one is to promote health and well-being and prevent disease by addressing its root causes. So it, it addressing the social determinants of health. And so a social determinant of health that prioritizes equity in marginalized populations, that works across sectors, needs to be integrated not just into pandemic prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. And I think we've learned a lot about how perhaps in the past we have not done that sufficiently, but also into all of our attempts for health and well-being. And so 
I, I think we've heard then the key dis disruptions and uh, directions, and I'd like to summarize those. I mean, firstly, uh, Professor Mwazwa has talked about the importance of community engagement and social mobilization, but taking that seriously, it is not about experts or people at, at the global level or health doctors or nurses necessarily telling communities what they need. It's about listening to communities. Communities of, don't, people don't live their lives in silos of sectors. Uh, they're, they're very keenly aware, wherever I've worked, and I've worked in a lot of countries, they're aware of what they need. It's really about supporting those aspirations and supporting the leadership of communities. But also without that community engagement, without that social mobilization, we will not be able to create the demand for action on social determinants of health. And we've seen that. It really is about the struggle for health. The need for intersectoral action, multi-sectoral action, whole of government action, whole of society action. We've been calling about this for a very long time. We need to clarify those concepts but if we cannot do this in the aftermath of COVID, whereas I think really everybody has seen how health is created and destroyed beyond the health sector, how it's not just about ministers of health or about doctors and nurses, it's about prime ministers, it's about foreign affairs, it's about trade, it's about education. This is our opportunity to leverage that experience to address the multi-sectoral challenges to health more broadly. Primary healthcare remains as relevant as ever. Primary healthcare is the approach and the contribution of the health sector to realize health equity. That remains as true as ever, and it is grounded in community engagement and intersectoral action. Education and capacity building, and thank you to Dr. Pelsdott here for her intervention. I think that was very helpful. I, I learned a lot. You'll be pleased to hear that we at WHO will be releasing a new guide to integrating social determinants of health into health workforce and training this later this year. I think it's true that it remains opaque, the concept of social determinants for so many. But we also need to sort of, as you say, arm our health workers with, with practical things they can do. Otherwise, if we say, well, it's your job to so solve the existential crises of, of climate, of infection and, and of war, it, it can be very demoralizing. It's, but really sort of supporting those practical measures with their communities, with patients, with people, that, that, can, that can lead to so much. But it is it's on that local level, but at that global level, the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All has recently laid out a number of briefs, and most recently about how we need to value health differently. We often think about, well, what does health contribute to the economy? But we should also be thinking about, well, how do we develop economies that deliver what is required for health and well-being? And here are the metrics and monitoring and evaluation. How do we bring information from beyond the health sector to be integrated by policymakers? to create health and well-being. That is something that we still struggle with. In the health sector, we are very focused on our own measures. We don't necessarily have a language to consider uh, metrics beyond the health sector. And, and then finally, I think there's a real scope for policy and implementation research on how to move on the social determinants of health equity and really get us beyond the health sector. This, this field is still dominated by people within health. And we talk about the need to act beyond the health sector but it's still generally health people talking about this. And so we need to think about the barriers to intersectoral action, the political economy, the asymmetries of power, how do we tackle those? Again, COVID provides us with a grand opportunity to reflect. So in summary, in my remarks, is to say that we have a great opportunity, that opportunity is receding fast. Crises can lead, can be major disruptors, can lead to transformational change, can lead to new institutions, the Great Depression, World War II, led to innovations, institutions, new ideas that led to tremendous reductions in equity. But crises can also go the other way. They can make things worse. They can entrench polarization and division. They can entrench ways of doing things. People can retreat among themselves. And so I think we have a choice as a society on, on the path forward. And, and so really the challenge for us is to undertake these grand transformations, to put these ideas into practice, to overcome the barriers to support communities in, in, in their aspirations. And certainly as WHO, that is something we hope to do uh, with renewed vigor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kuman, and um, really appreciate your, your passionate inputs there. And you've really covered a whole breadth of, of issues and depth of issues that um, pervade this, this space of social justice and injustice, equity and inequity in health. And, um, and I think that uh, 
you know, you've already given us some things to think about in terms of how we move forward. But I would like to invite all of you with the time that we have left to, to engage on how to make some of these things concrete. Um, we are a global health community gathered here. And um, it, it has already been pointed out in the Q&A by Keith that all of us struggle with how to get policymakers to take issues related to social determinants of health, issues related to social justice, issues related to equity, seriously. And we need to have a way of presenting this to them such that they can see value in supporting this work. So my first question for all of you, each one of you, and I will go around um, requesting you to think about this, is both from your experience before, I know Francis, you have a lot of experience working with policymakers over the years, from your experiences before, but also from the experiences during COVID-19, the disruption that arose because of COVID-19. What is it that can help us to get the policymakers to take the agenda of uh, social determinants of health seriously? What is the value proposition here that we could, we could uh, take forward as, as part of um, our action item from, from this panel. Let me start with you, Francis, and I'll just go to Jock and Vincent at command and after that. Wow, <clears throat> great, <clears throat> great presentations. And also a very important opening question. My uh, takeaway from COVID is that for once, it has put health where it belongs in terms of uh, uh, the affairs of the world. For a long time, we have been led by, I don't want to cause a war here, we've been led in health planning, health financing by economists who believed that what you needed was economic growth and that would do everything. But COVID bringing the world to a standstill has made it very clear to those who, who are willing to learn that without putting in place strong health systems based in integrated people-centered primary health care are required for the next pandemic and to make it less painful than this one. So that's my takeaway uh, a message from here. Uh, uh, Professor Paul Collier, you know him, uh, was at the World Bank and now he's a professor in Oxford. He told us in 2019 in Berlin that for the last 40 years, they have been teaching wrong economics of profit, profit. But profit for what? So if it is profit for better society, profit for healthier people, and health as the center of everything, then maybe COVID has opened the way for us for a major transformation in prioritizing the health of people, including social determinants of health. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mas. Uh, Yes, and I think it's a very important point that Professor Maswa uh, is highlighting. And, and it's interesting, there are, there, is, uh, there are some efforts out there uh, to sort of shift this focus on what we value, not just seeing growth and focus on health and well-being, because it is true, it needs to be, there needs to be health in all policy. However, I do think, I mean, there's, politicians have a short, attention span and often short election cycles. So it's very hard to, to get politicians to, to sort of think in terms of long, maybe I'm generalizing here, but um, think in terms of long-term. And I think we need to 
shift in two ways, perhaps, to think about demonstrating, quote unquote, the return on investment. If we look at the cost of this sort of throwing money at the problem when it's already been developed versus what it might have cost if we'd actually built strong community oriented and patient-centered primary care system, I think that would be an interesting a way of doing it, but perhaps also breaking it down and, and literally in pretty simple terms, illustrating why this is so essential. And I do think this also, uh, we, we can build al alliances with communities because in, in you know, certainly in the democratic regions, they are voters. And if they are partners in this effort, and if they understand and get a voice in, in talking about how important this is, and if we are good enough uh, and effective enough in, in gathering data and evidence and demonstrating with that data, using all kinds of sources, not just health sector sources, but to both understand the challenges and then engage with communities in terms of how to address them, and then involve the politicians in that process. Hopefully we'll, we'll get a little further along. Thank you very much. That's very interesting to me because also in a way, it's something that we take for granted, but the powerful voices of communities, especially because the community voices are also the same people who are going to be voting as well in many of these countries. And so uh, an agenda that centralizes health and well-being in those voices, in those demands for change or transformation um, then can actually be quite powerful. And in a way, we may find that if the value proposition for social determinants of health is actually carried by the voices of communities themselves, we may actually end up having to do less work. Maybe we are making a mistake, as you say, in trying to present it only more from a scientific perspective. But I also agree with you that I think demonstrating the cost that we could avoid by promoting health um, and promoting health, healthy populations and avoiding the consequences of ill health, then that might also uh, be persuasive. Let me go to uh, Vincent, your, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a very interesting question. And I've been reflecting on it, looking at uh, the experience of Rwanda, what has been happening in Rwanda uh, mm -hmm. since the aftermath of the genocide suicide against Tusi, where there was that disruption, that emergency, everything collapsed and the country has to rebuild. And interestingly, and that would, what I would say made life easier for us as healthcare providers to be the one actually making the case for social determinant of health, we saw actually that coming for uh, 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 policymakers, for politicians, from the country leaders, actually, they were the one who were saying that we can't talk about healthcare, uh, ignoring all the social determinants of health, not tackling poverty, not improving education. It was important uh, from just after the genocide to start building, building the country with that mindset. Then for healthcare providers like us, it, it was not really too hard. To, to, to just accompany the government in that process. And that's what actually PIH has been doing. It was really much more easier for, 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 for PIH to sell the, that accompaniment model, accompaniment model uh, uh, in a way that we, we not only build uh, the infrastructures of the health system, but we also uh, go and try to tackle and support the government in tackling the social determinant of health. And uh, that really made also the life of, I would say, of PIH much more easier here in Rwanda compared to other countries where it's actually uh, based. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back to this issue of uh, healthcare workers and how health workers relate or should be relating with the agenda for social determinants of health, especially because of some of the things that you mentioned in your study and also what Job mentions. In, 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 in her presentation. But let's hear uh, lastly from Kumana on this value proposition for policymakers. 
Well, I, I think colleagues have already addressed this point well, but I think this is the challenge. Maybe a couple of things I'll add. I mean, I think that uh, we need to look at our own limitations firstly, that the concept is still challenging for people, it's still opaque. I think it's very, the, the strength of this is that it's a complex discourse, but that is also its weakness in that uh, we often want to come up with more and more nuanced concepts, frameworks. It's very important in the chat that we now consider commercial determinants we're considering digital determinants in our new world report this year for WHO, we will revise the framework. But I, I think that we need to understand that, that that is not easy for people to, we do need to have a language that, it, it doesn't really matter if people use the phrase social determinants of health because communities call us different things, other sectors will consider different things and we need to be comfortable with that. I, I think the other thing is for us really to focus on thinking about these barriers to action, which are partly a lot about politics. Uh, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing but medicine writ large. Uh, we really need to engage with those politics, those issues of power, those asymmetries, those interests and, of the political economy, so to speak, and think, well, what, why might people act on this? One of the challenges is this is a long-term agenda and political cycles are short. But I think here we have this crisis uh, I think, you know, Vincent just mentioned as well, crises can lead to disruptions, to systematic yeah. change. And we need to take advantage of this, to take advantage of this time when prime ministers and finance ministers and foreign affairs ministers have really focused on health. And, you know, th this is that moment. I, I think the other thing is take is on the equity, is to say that, you know, acting on equity is not just a nice thing to do, but if you have unequal polarized societies, you do not have resilient societies, you cannot respond to crises effectively. So it's not just a nice thing to do, to believe in social justice. It's actually essential to having a successful society. And I think a lot of leaders increasingly understand that. What we then need to do, I think, in, in the health sector is then think, well, how can we support communities, policymakers who want to act? Uh, one of the things I think we struggle with is that on the one hand, we say social determinants are very important, but on the other hand, we're always saying, well, we need more money for healthcare, for UHC. They're complementary. Both are true, but we might need to consider how, how we frame that. I, I think the other thing to say is that I, it is also about values. You can have the instrumental argument, but without that demand, without that social mobilization and struggle, if you look at the countries that have made progress, it, it doesn't happen. So, so again, how do we support communities? How do we support that social mobilization? So key. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to raise the next point, and this this is related to partly to the issue of the health sector, the health workers, the global health community, kind of being the facilitator of change. Now, a number of you have mentioned if you have to do that, you must engage with communities, and there are old models of training that, for example. We're talking about community-oriented primary care and so forth. Other people have adopted them. They've worked for them. But the notion of a health worker having to engage with what happens in the community is something that's not easy for us. You know, even in family medicine or community medicine, we learn about it, but practicing it is not necessarily easy. Then also there are this, there's this issue of having to engage with multi-sectors. If you want to help a patient, or a person who is presenting with a particular health condition, but it's got other vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. You don't have the resources to, to address them. And Joga, I think you mentioned that point. Now, as a health worker, you need to have those resources, but those resources are sitting in other sectors. It could be sectors of government or sectors of community, but you need to mobilize those resources in those different sectors in order to support the patient. When the patient is in front of you and you are in a health facility, that's not easy to do. But if the person is in the community, often those resources can be, can be mobilized. And it comes back to this point you're mentioning, uh, Kumana, you're mentioning around the, the, the multi-sectoral approach that we need to do. Now, all of this go against the kind of training that we go through. We are often trained uh, within a particular specialty, a particular uh, field, and we don't, we're not necessarily trained to understand different fields. And on top of that, we, we are taught to practice within our specialty. We are not necessarily used to practicing in that way that is interprofessional or 
with collaborative practice. These concepts are there as opportunities. Now, what is it that you suggest we do in terms of positioning the health sector, the healthcare workers, to be able to facilitate this multi-sectoral approach that we so need to help us deal with social determinants, to help us reduce these inequities. Um, let me start with Kumanan and go the other way. Kumanan? It's a very important question. And I, and I think, you know, the, the complexity is, as I said, is a challenge, but we need to make the point that, you know, it may say tr sound trite, but everybody has a contribution to make. And I, I don't think it's helpful to suggest that frontline health workers' jobs is to reform global economic systems or to solve wars, right? Sure. And so I think we need to pitch or be practical. And one of the things we're trying to do in our guide is sort of say for people working in specific programs or in primary health care, what can they do? But primary health care has, as an approach, has been doing this for decades, right? There are examples throughout where primary health care as an approach, as it said in Almirata, linked to the proximal determinants, linked to local level, the needs, you know, and then Almirata talked about water and sanitation, I talked about education. That has been happening for many times. We have many examples around the world of primary health care teams which don't just include health workers, they include community workers who link to social services. And I think that is something that is, is, is more achievable. I mean, I remember myself being a physician and working in emergency a long time ago. And one of the reasons I ended up in public health was my own frustration about feeling very disempowered about the social conditions that people lived in and that were driving me to what presented them to emergency departments. So I, I think that what we can do is support the understanding, yes, practical actions, but also in the health sector and managing health services, uh, encourage and facilitate local link between health and social services. And so health workers have a sense of, of what they can do. But then I also think it's also about seeding leadership. It's not just about health workers. So it's really about health workers understanding that a lot of what determines people's health is other sectors, other people in their communities at yeah. the local level and, and not trying to do everything. And so, uh, we just need to support health workers as part of communities to take action on social determinants. And I think primary health care provides that guide, but there's a lot more that we can do. Thank you. Vincent? Thank you. I find both uh, questions, the first one you asked and this one complementary. And uh, what I can say, and I'll talk also from the perspective of a family physician that I am, um, we, we tend actually, and, and this may be due to our, our training, where we spend most of our time trained in those big hospitals, we tend to see health as what is happening in the hospitals. And then there is that disconnect in the way we practice, uh, and I'm talking about uh, my experience with what I've seen uh, as a practitioner, as a clinician, there is what we do in the hospital, then there is what is happening in the community, and many of the health care providers will not be really involved in the, what is happening in the, the community, or even linking both. You find clinicians doing their clinical work, those who went through uh, 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 trainings like public health now, focusing on what is happening in the community in terms of Healthcare, and they, and they may not have that perspective, which is very important from clinicians who will see a patient. And from that one patient, they'll understand that there's something going on in that community that we need to know. There are some problem, problems with the social determinant in that community. And that's something I got from my training uh, as a family physician that sometimes I see lacking because it's, it can create that connection between uh, what we are doing as healthcare providers our perspective of healthcare and what is happening in those communities that we solve in a way that I think we are well placed also to play that role of advocate because it may be challenging to, 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 to play both the, the clinician role and the, 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 the or say be, be sitting in a table of where decisions are taken in the, in the community, but we still have that opportunity to advocate and um, now in my current uh, work, 
what we do, uh, we, we make sure that uh, as an organization, and here I'm talking about partners in health, from what is happening in the health, uh, uh, the, the, the health facilities that we support, from the patient that we receive, we, we, we try now to build the social support uh, that uh, um, uh, is somehow uh, connected to the need of those, uh, uh, not only patient, but the community where they're coming from. Uh, and, that, and that is our model. And I would say even in Rwanda in general, that, that is the model that is applied, especially from coming from healthcare, trying to, to, to understand the other needs of patients beyond only the, 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 the clinical needs will come from the patient we are, we are seeing going to the community. Yeah. It's not a perfect model because again, as a family physician, uh, there are those patients who will never come to the, the, the health facilities that also we need to consider in, in, in the support that we provide. And of course, there, there are still ways to improve. I don't have answer to all those uh, questions, but they're still there. They're still there. Yeah. Thank you. In, in a way, what you are highlighting is the importance of shifting from focusing just on diseases and focusing on people, even in the way that we educate, train, and position our, our healthcare workers. So, um, Jock, you next. Absolutely. I think sort of building on what's been said, it, it, I think it's pretty clear that uh, in a lot of ways, there's a very biomedical focus of, of health. And that's why I think the, the training is so important. Uh, so that when, no matter whether it's a, you know, whether you become a hand surgeon or, you know, specialist or not, everybody does need to understand that whatever treatment they prescribe, what may be the root cause. I mean, they really, uh, and, and if you get an experience during the time that you're learning, not just from hospital settings, but actually, and, and not from short, you know, sort of uh, medical visits, but actually spend time in those communities and learn to listen. Because again, obviously, and I, I do think that folks coming out of primary care and family medicine already have a much broader understanding uh, than many that, who are mostly hospital centric. But, but I do think this is the skills involved are very much also related to communication, really listening and asking the right questions. Because certainly, for example, from a case study in Nepal, um, because the graduates there had spent such a, a time in those communities, they knew that it might take people two days to walk to the health center, meaning that they would only come when they were desperate. So they would, you know, first of all, look at, they knew which insurances they might be able to, to use in order to get access. They would really focus on health education to, to make sure people really understood what they needed to do with the medications. They might give them medications for a longer time, et cetera. They, they, sort of, they understood the context and obviously advocacy is an important level uh, part as well. So communication effort there as well. But, but I think also uh, what was mentioned before in terms of working across sectors, you're not as a clinician gonna be providing all the solutions, but understanding who might be involved or, or to some extent, rather than focusing on, on, especially with shelf knowledge changing so quickly, focusing on producing problem solvers, people who know what questions to ask, where to go, I think it's really important. And, and shifting that focus away from sort of a medicalized approach to, to look at health and well being and what that takes, and knowing that that, that requires broad range of not only health workers and professionals, and I think it was mentioned before, working closely, for example, with community health workers, but working across sectors. And that's a skill that I think uh, needs to be taught in, in health workforce education. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Prof. Massa? Wow, that's a um, very difficult <laughs> question to give that. A short answer to me, uh, it is uh, two things. Number one, the preparation of health workers. The link between the health system and the education system. I was privileged to have uh, 
grown up through the Makerere Medical School in the 1960s. And apart from those basic sciences, anatomy, physiology, and so on, we spent the largest part of the curriculum on a topic which was called preventive medicine. They took us to live with communities and they made sure that each illness that ended up in the clinic, you asked the question, where did this come from? So I personally and my generation and many others have grown up with that approach and I have lived it uh, throughout my practice. I ended up, by the way, becoming a surgeon and not a public health yeah. worker. Yeah. And my first six months when I came back to work in Uganda as a cardiothoracic surgeon, there were six patients, very senior people in the government with carcinoma of the bronchus, all heavy smokers. So I started the Uganda Anti-Tobacco Association, which mm. is alive up to now. And there are other examples like that. So first training, linking the training of uh, health workers to the causes of diseases, the social determinants of health. Then number two is the health system. You need to have the ability to construct a health system that gets its priorities right. And the higher priority should be to keep healthy people healthy, stopping people from losing their inborn health. And that should be the priority of the health system, not treating uh, uh, diseases. Yet, in practice, the pressures mm. to focus and put more money into medical care are stronger than those to keeping healthy people healthy through health promotion and disease prevention. You know, a, a motor yeah. accident has occurred. You have to treat that person. A baby has to be born, obstructed labor. Come on, you have to deal with that. So that attracts the attention of the health system and even the resources instead of having a strong uh, 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 foresighted leadership which gets a balance between these two. So that is my answer, the training, yeah. and then building a, a responsive health system. Can you give your parting shot in, in, in 30 seconds in terms of how are we going to uh, make sure that these lessons are sustained for the next uh, pandemic? Parting shot, 30 seconds. Afri Health, Georgina, that's your job. Yes, make sure I'm that uh, Afri African African <laughs> governments get our message. That's my answer. Parting <laughs> short. Thank you. And sing with it. I think uh, I think Keith Martin is also here. I saw you posting a question. So uh, Keith, together yes. with Afri Health, let's for him. make this happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jack. Parting short. Thirty seconds. Next pandemic. What What's your parting short? Um. I'm trying to be optimistic, <laughs> but, but it is a struggle. We see how, how governments and politicians shift very quickly. Uh, but I think we just have to be diligent and, and think about how we can link with allies, whether they be communities or other sectors, that, that, so that we can sort of join forces and illustrate why this is essential, uh, that, that we address these underlying issues. Otherwise, it's going to be the same, old, same old, same old. It's, I, I have to say and acknowledge that that I'm not very proud of the international response in general. Uh, so, so I think you know it's been clear you can't necessarily rely on that. But, but I do think it's sort of a call for action to build alliances and share lessons learned and share evidence. Each one of you know, the stakeholders bring something important. And as long as we build on each other's effort and support each other, and, and again, listen to communities, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. We're heading in the and right direction, I hope. I think that's why Francis is saying Afri Health and CUGH. Thank you so much. Um, Vincent, parting short, 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, uh, in French, they say, après la pluie, le bon temps. 
uh, after the storm is the, 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 the good time and uh, I, I'll stay optimistic. I think we've uh, generated a lot of data around what happened with COVID-19 either in responding to it or in coping with its consequences, a lot of stories. Then for me, all these shouldn't end up in a cupboard. It will be yeah. a time, especially for those who are still engaged, involved uh, among us in uh, academia and teaching the future generation of not only healthcare providers, but uh, other uh, uh, people in different uh, sectors to, to teach using those stories, using those data. So as we, we, yeah. are, we are prepared for the next pandemic. Th that, will, that will be my, my, my take on uh, this conversation. Let's prepare the next generation properly using the lessons that we've learned. Kumana. Last word. Uh, yeah, thanks for, for a great panel discussion and thanks for your very good moderation. I, I think for me, it's about us as a health sector being humble. We've lived through a couple of years where people have realized you don't have to be a doctor or a nurse to make the important decisions on health. People have understood the centrality of health to their aspirations to their lives and understand social determinants. So we in health need to recognize that and not try and take back the leadership but facilitate that leadership beyond our sector and link these crises and say it's not just about labs and vaccines they're very important but link these problems we've had in this pandemic to the other crises we face and say that health yeah. is about all of us and really respect that leadership of communities, of people beyond the health sector. Walk the talk. We say the social determinants of health and then we want to exert all the leadership ourselves. And I think if we're more humble, if we build on this experience, I'm, I, I try to be optimistic. Of course, the, the history is that we forget and there's that cycle of panic and neglect, but let's not let that repeat this time. With that, we close the session and thank you so much. And uh, um, for, to all the panelists, Professor Omasa, York, Pastor Detea, Vincent, Chewbacca, and Kuman, and, and thank you so much for all the inputs and for all the issues that you've raised and looking forward to the next session. Thank you so much, uh, Kodiko.